Okay, uh, so let's start the se second session this morning. Uh, our next speaker is Alfredo Iorio, and he will, first we need to upload his presentation. So here it is. So he will talk about what's the M equals zero PTC black hole in the lab. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, all right, my talk, uh, actually, it will be most of it will be on the first and third line, so towards lab. And uh, somehow, uh, I'm very happy that uh, it was very well chosen, the sequence of talks, because uh, uh, in a way, this talk is trying to understand from condensed matter what we can learn about the high energy uh, theories that we have in our mind. Uh, while, for instance, the talks that I heard about before, the wonderful talks, were somehow employing methods of high energy uh, phys mathematics or physics into, into, into condensed matter systems. Okay, so it's made up the talk, the plan is to follow uh, the following. Uh, so the first bit I'll be, I'll be attempting um, a discussion on analogs in general, uh, along the lines of the famous lecture of, of, of uh, uh, Richard Feynman. Uh, uh, this could be done in a very sophisticated and, 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 and appropriate philosophical way by, by philosophers of science or physics, and there is a lot of discussion about that, but I'll try to do it my way using, let me say, Feynman's arguments, and I'll, try, uh, I'll hope to convey the main message uh, that we can use this analog to try to answer some of the questions that are open uh, from from the uh, fundamental research in high energy. Then I'll, 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 I'll describe uh, the case I'm most, uh, let me say, familiar with, which is the case of Dirac materials. I will be showing why this particular set of materials, uh, it started off with graphene, but now it's an entire family, uh, lend themselves very well to answer at least certain questions about fundamental, fundamental physics. And then I'll, I'll keep my promise, uh, the promise of the title. I'll be using these arguments to see how the realization of a, a very specific black hole in two plus one dimension in a very specific regime, uh, which is M equals zero, may help us understand some of these issues. Okay, so uh, this is analogs. It's, it's, uh, this is uh, taken from, a, from a, a, a photographer, Australian photographer. And it takes pictures of waves, and, and, and uh, this is the best place to show such a picture to illustrate what an analog is. He says that nature sometimes imitates itself, okay? So this is a wave imitating a mountain. Uh, okay, so uh, we all have heard, at least uh, we all know about the famous uh, uh, lecture by Feynman. It's, uh, it's a lecture in his uh, lectures on physics, okay, where essentially the, the sentence there that everybody uh, knows about is uh, same equation, same solutions, okay? So in this lecture, he, he, he realizes that there are a series of problems completely uncorrelated un un between them in, in principle. You see, they are listed over here, okay? That can all be solved, or most of it can be solved, by just uh, looking at the same equation that you will write for electrostatics, okay? So, uh, the same equation, same solution story can be, can be uh, 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 summarized in this pictorial way by saying that all these five cases of the lecture there are essentially uh, related to the electrostatics, okay? So whatever you, 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 you know of, of one of these things, you can bring it down back to electrostatics or vice versa. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, this is what, uh, let me say, everybody knows about this uh, this famous lecture, it's some, somehow a sort of coincidence. But that lecture uh, goes, goes ahead. Uh, he, Feynman asked himself, uh, why this is happening, okay? And we actually use, we actually used to, to uh, use one system for another. And, and, and in the first three cases here, this is something, let me say, very, uh, very well respected, okay? We know that uh, if we find, a certain a symmetry, so we can write a an action in terms of different variables, and although it's equal to the first one, okay, we can do calculation here, and you know that it's gonna be, you know, the same result 
that you, that you're gonna find over there. Uh, you can do you know more sophisticated things. You can have maps that don't map the action to itself but into something different. But still, you can use these maps to understand regimes uh, uh, which are connected by this uh, with the, by this arrow. And then you know I cite here oh, probably the most famous of these uh, dualities, which is uh, the the SFT. Uh, all the stuff here is all about uh, knowing that you are actually dealing with the same structure, okay? And, and uh, that what you have to do, you have to find the right variables or the right duality and so on and so forth. There is not some, such a thing considered yet for, for analogy, or at least not in a, in, a general, in a general sense. And that's where, you know, uh, Feynman goes on asking himself why this, this, uh, this, uh, this phenomena are, are, are uh, you know, responding in the same way. Okay, and it is. It is. Uh, I mean, I really recommend that if you know to 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 read this uh, this this lecture because it is uh, really impressive that by using you know this famous Feynman approach to physics, very practical, very very experimental, he, 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 he essentially ends up positing the existence of of particles that make everything. Okay, which he calls hexons, and uh, it is it is uh, fun that. Uh, Eight years later, as we and this audience people know very well, okay. Um, for instance, taking the Bagerstein proposal of the of the bound of Bagerstein uh, itself, essentially posited the existence of this, of this fundamental level. So the, the the bottom line here is that if we, if we want to take uh, you know uh, our system seriously, what we have to do, we have to think that all of them, you see, including this electrostatic, insist on a common structure. Okay, this is something that Feynman said. And this is actually uh, something that one has to, uh, one, one to one, uh, if one wants to take seriously analogs as, as probes of fundamental physics, that's what he has to try to, uh, to, to find. This, this fundamental structure common to all and these arrows and give them specific meanings, very precise meanings to these things. So that one can go, uh, uh, let's say, ahead than the, 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 the amusing the divertissement of, of seeing that one system behaves like another. In this case, then, you know that each of them would answer the questions about this fundamental one in its own specific way. So what I just try to say uh, in this few sentences, if you, these slides is in, as I said, in this famous lecture by, by Feynman, uh, which is written here, and uh, it's part of a, of a very, as I said, specific and, 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 and uh, let me say, professional discussion by philosophers this is just one of the papers. And here is uh, a little bit, and here's my own contribution to it, but I put it last. Okay, so let's take a specific case now. After this attempt to do a general discussion of why it's interesting to use uh, uh, analogs to say something about fundamental physics. So the case of the Dirac materials. So, so now I'll go a little bit more into, into mathematical uh, details. You will see some formula now. Okay, so what I'm talking about is something that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is something that uh, uh, is called Dirac materials. So it's, it's structures um, uh, like, like this. So lattice structures are two dimensional. You will see a picture here that you will understand in a moment. Uh, uh, in the particular case of graphene, these uh, spots, white and black, are, are actually uh, carbon atoms. Uh, and they are disposed in this particular way. What is uh, um, important to understand from the condensed matter point of view uh, that, that this is not a brevi lattice. Lattice, you need, you know, you need two sorts of vectors. Uh, that the, the one, the set of vectors that carry you from the black to the black. And once you go to the black, you need another set of vectors. And, and, and these things make the, 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 the lattice not a brevi lattice. So the typical, um, uh, the description of the, of the conductivity properties of this material is given in, uh, uh, by the standard tight, uh, tight binding Hamiltonian, that in the case of graphene, this parameter is given by this number. In the case of other, of other uh, drug materials, this number changes. And you see, you have this hopping uh, structure, okay? So uh, the sublattice A, sublattice B. So you see these things acts in such a way that you destroy a B particle, then you create an A particle, and so on and so forth. And that's how you move along here. So I have this notation eta one, and then you see more etas below, but usually this, op this hopping object is called T in the literature. So what you do, you do uh, a Fourier transform of that, 
okay, of everything, everything you see there, and the very same Hamiltonian that you see over here becomes this one. So this is sort of an exact thing. And you see that this, there's a function appearing, which I call uh, Carly F1, which encodes all the information, all, all the structure, the geometric structure in here. It's a complex function and it's given by the state. Okay, so uh, our condensed matter friends, what they do to study this, uh, the properties of this material, they want to understand whether it's a, a conductor, a semiconductor, an insulator, whether, uh, so what they have to do, they have to study the, the dispersion relation. So they write the secular equation, they solve it, the determinant equals zero, and they get something like that, okay? And then they ask, is this happening? Okay, so this should be a question mark over here. Is this actually happening? Because if when this happens, it means that the valence, this is plus and minus, the valence and conductivity band touch somewhere. Well, in this case, it happens, and it happens at these points, okay? These points, which are called the Dirac points. Uh, you define these parameters as, as a, it's a parameter with the dimension of, of a velocity, and this is now the very same Hamiltonian, but written in a, you know, this is not exact anymore. So you're going a little far away from the Dirac point, you, uh, this P is a small object, and, cl and close to there, the Hamiltonian, what it looks like. And then, then you see why it's called Dirac, these objects are called Dirac materials. The stuff just completely naturally emerged. So no, let uh, me say, imposition on the system. That's what it counts, okay? The sigmas here are called, uh, people call it the, the pseudospin uh, Pauli matrices, but they're just Pauli matrices, and that's, that's the way to do Okay, so this stuff was uh, uh, essentially discovered by the people uh, immediately, uh, actually, I have to say, That there's a beautiful paper by, by Gordon Semenov in the 80s, where it, it is supposed that, you know, if, what, what if I can take graphite and make it two dimensional, and then he gets exactly this structure. Then people have found the thing in the lab, they got a few, a couple of Nobel Prizes, and this paper got, I don't know, 20, 25,000 citations and things like that. So this stuff is very much interesting. So let's keep going. And, and then you see, again, my pictures coming from the analog uh, discussion before. So what I'm just doing, when you have an Hamiltonian, why don't you write a, a, an action as well, a Lagrangian associated to that, and it exceedingly the fact that this is a sort of pseudo-relativistic structure. So your, your time component is now C, not CT, but VFT, uh, hiding behind this thing here. Okay, uh, fine. And uh, now you suppose that if you make, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you put some curvature into the system, okay, this is uh, the, 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 the corresponding uh, action in the from office covariant uh, fashion. And here is where uh, I say we found a hook. We found a way to define these arrows in a very specific way. Because we know that in general, not just for three dimensions, for any dimension, when the, 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 the metric is, is conformally flat and the, 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 the field transformed this way with the, the, the appropriate conformal factor, while symmetry tells us that this stuff is going to be equivalent to, to, to the flat space. So the flat space story is what people have found in the lab and the cover space, at least when you are in this conformally flat situation, is something you may, you may say is related, okay, to, 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 to the flat one, uh, through, through this symmetry. Okay, so uh, time's flying. So we are, as I said, this is gonna happen in any dimension, although there's a tree here because it's a two plus one dimensional structure. All right, but, uh, uh, now let's specify to n equal three in n equal three, and let's uh, go out there and try to sell a metric to our condensing matter friends. I could not be able to sell anything more than this. Okay, so it's a one over here, zero, zero, and a two dimensional static metric. Okay, something that uh, a relativist uh, told me, ah, oh, this is an hyperstatic metric. What can you do with that? Well, you can do something precisely because this, 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 this huge symmetry at your disposal. You have vice symmetry at your disposal. So what you can do, uh, uh, you can actually add yet another constraint and say, look, I want this to be conformally flat, okay? And these things all together, this, these things all together tells you that this is happening when the, um, the surface, let me say, the manifold described by this two-dimensional metric has got Gaussian Gaussian curvature. Okay, so reversing the logic, if you take this graphene, you make a two-dimensional uh, surface with constant Gaussian curvature, you know that the three-dimensional metric is conformally flat in, in two plus one dimension, including time. Okay, it's within this fashion, but you know that cotton tension is zero, so you're going to find the coordinates where, this coordinates where this stuff is written explicitly as a factor times eta exists, and that's all you need to know. 
Okay, so it's not that you have to shoot the objects out there in the space or do something that's very strange with the time. If you actually do something on the material, the space time part, you're going to have a conformally flat structure in two, in two plus one dimension. Uh, what is it uh, of constant Gaussian curvature? Well, this uh, uh, immediately comes to the mind the sphere. Okay, and a little bit more in the positive curvature case. Okay, you have these two other objects which are all of constant curvature. And they're all applicable to the sphere anyway. So essentially, it's the sphere over here. Now you see, from this arrow on, from this arrow to the right here, you have an infinite number of surfaces that obey this constraint, that they are of a negative constant uh, Gaussian curvature. Okay, these first three are pseudospheres. Okay, this is the famous Beltrami pseudosphere. This is the hyperbolic, and this is where I will keep my promise of talking about the BTZ. And this is the elliptic, uh, but this is just a pseudosphere, which, go, which are the surfaces of evolution. So they have some, some, some uh, rotational symmetry, but this, this keeps going forever, forever. It's an infinite number of, of, of objects. Actually, if you discover one, put your name on it, because that stuff is going to be related to, to solitons. It's a, it's a rich field. It's a rich field, okay? So each time you do that, you, can, you are sure that there is some, some interesting stuff to do on the map side. But um, on the physics side, and that's what I come to my analog uh, thing. On the physics side, uh, if you pick up this particular one, this particular object, which is the Beltran pseudosphere, for, 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 for many reasons, you know, there's been a lot of work on that. Uh, you can, and you actually build up an object of graphene made of, of this, of this atom, this carbon atoms, okay? My condenser and matter friends will not be happy that I call this thing graphene. For them, graphene is just a planar stuff. Whatever you, when you fold them, you make a fullerene, you make a nanotube, you make something else, it's another allotrope. But, I'll, you know, among us, I can say that I take graphene, I make, like, it's, it's like a membrane, I make this, this shape, okay? And this stuff has been, you know, we've been doing simulations and so on and so forth, so we can actually build up these things. This is not a, um, something that comes out of art, this is something that the, um, my collaborators, my younger collaborators made uh, in, in, in a computer simulation. Okay, so you go through the calculation, you find that this thing is conformal to the real space time. So if you actually do some measurements of the local density of states, you're going to find a, a, an important departure from the a flat case of graphene, which is in green over here. And you're going to be able to see some sort of Hawking Huru effect with a specific temperature given by, the, by this thing. Okay? So what is it actually over there? What uh, this have, this have this, so that that little thing that, that that little graphene thing has this dispersion relation. So depending on the regime, this lambda here is the, the wavelength of the electrons. Depending on the regime you are, you can simulate. You can have a you can have a a, 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 a realization, a condensing matter realization of uh, of various different regimes. So say situation where you have a that, that field on a, on a, on a covered background. Uh, you know, when you are very, very close to the to the tip here, uh, then you can keep going and then you have in the flat space description, which is something that everybody knows. But then you can actually, you can actually go a little farther away, okay, up in here, and you can start seeing granular effects, uh, like uh, you see the effects of this, this LSD is the length of the, of the lattice spacing, up until where, where you, know, you are happy and the, the field description is gone completely. And the only thing you have is that, is that quantum mechanical stuff. Uh, and this is uh, in, in, in formula is written in this expression where I show you the full Hamiltonian, but not just the diagonal term, excuse me, the off diagonal term with M equal one is present, which is the one I showed in the beginning. Okay, so if you actually include in this in the structure um, terms which go beyond the, the, the first, which is the near neighbors, you can go to, this, to the next to near neighbors and you have this mm -hmm. diagonal terms, but in principle you actually could go uh, indefinitely. All right, this is the true Hamiltonian, and then you discover that uh, at least for the nest to near neighbor structure, there is a relation between F1 and F2. This relation is very important because if you actually define this capital P is related to this function, so you can redefine everything in terms of only one of the functions, the Hamiltonian takes this structure, and this is something that from people, um, that two people that know about the, the GUP, the generalized uncertainty principle and so on and so forth, it's, it's, it's very important, okay? So when we actually wrote down this thing, they were very happy uh, that we have a parameter here that depends on the L, this L in their story is Planck land, here is the lattice spacing, and we have this correction to the, to the Dirac, the simple Dirac 
in terms of the square object here, which uh, in the end, you go through the steps and you find this, this commutation relations modified by this parameter. Okay, so uh, these are the references for this part. This is the famous uh, uh, paper where the two discoverers, which are these two guys, Novosel of Angheim, and the theorists that explain to them what they've done, which is Paco Guinea. Okay, they wrote this beautiful, beautiful review. So if you want to know about the, uh, the basic stuff of graphene and how it is treated, uh, I mean, how, how, you, how you realize a, a special relativistic system is, is in this, although it's old, all the basics is there. Okay, and so this is where the Bile story and graphene started. This is where we see the Hawking. Okay, and this is a bunch of papers that we are uh, writing with uh, younger collaborators on, on various directions. And this is actually an important paper for me. Uh, because this is why we've actually been doing the simulation. And this uh, gentleman here is the one that produced this, this, uh, this um, uh, carbon structure that he would never call uh, graphene. He would call it some, some, some allotrope. Okay, so uh, you saw no BTZ black hole in here. And uh, uh, now I'll try to keep my promise. Why, for instance, this scenario can be used again to answer questions coming from the high energy. All right, so remember uh, this, this shape here, which is uh, quite key to what I'm gonna say. It's a very simple what I'm gonna say, but I hope to convey the message. How much time do I have left? Not 10 minutes? Not, no problem. I have 10 minutes, okay. <coughs> so let me go back to this uh, GUP story, you know, and it is known in the field that uh, uh, you can have a modification of the of the of the standard, let's say, uncertainty here, uh, due to the fact essentially that when you try to localize the the, the 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 particle and you pour a lot of energy into there, if the energy of the particle the, of the photon of the wavelength of the photon becomes uh, as big as the Schwarzschild radius, for instance, associated to that photon, then then you cannot go beyond that. Okay, so then there is a tension between these two these two terms and people draw their picture. So this stuff is, is quite well known and uh, people have come up with the expressions for this gravitational radius, which is uh, given here for n equal four. Uh, and there is a generalization of that for n greater than four. Okay. Uh, and all this leads to the, to the to this generalized uncertainty principle. And the issue was was not uh, faced in lower dimension. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, well, we know why because and, and you know when you go up in dimensions, you, you don't kill the standard tensor of GR of n equal four because while is still there, everything is still there. When you actually go down in dimension, many of these tensors die, like while, for instance. So you have to really define things up until the case when in n equal two, you don't even have a standard uh, gravity theory. But n equal three is sort of middle way. In n equal three, uh, and this is our contribution, we have uh, uh, found that, uh, okay, you either uh, give up with this idea Okay, for the peculiarities of n equal three, or you can rely upon the BTZ black hole. Okay, so the BTZ black hole can be the black hole to uh, consider in this localization process uh, in, in two plus one dimension. What is the BTZ black hole? Well, these audience knows very well uh, this stuff, but I want to go through this uh, uh, simple steps to show you why graphene can come into hand in the story. So this is the metric uh, of the BTC, I'm calling the most general form, where I include also the angular momentum J, okay? Um, in my notation, this capital R is the variable, okay? And I will have little r, lowercase r, as the fixed radius of curvature. Uh, this is something that comes from the previous uh, notation, okay? So you have a mass, you have angular momentum, this is the, and you have a cosmological constant, okay? Uh, Fine, and this cosmological constant needs to be negative, so because this stuff some, some, somehow has to go to uh, ADS three when you go to the to the asymptotics. Okay, fine. The horizons only one of them is event horizon, which is R plus, and are given by this formula, and it's easy to, to to find them given the function over here. And we have a black hole when m is greater than zero, and j is within this range. But there is also an extremal case. Okay, which is just very. Um, uh, interesting and uh, and peculiar <laughs> of the BTZ, which is the extremal case. Okay, apart, apart from the fact, that, for instance, when you actually go to zero, J is zero, okay, 
uh, let me say better. You can go to M0 and keep J, okay? But it, the, the thing is that in the M equals zero case, which in the standard uh, stage faster would, would mean that there is no black hole left. You have, we are left with the, the Minkowski space, okay? In here is still something that belongs to the, to the spectrum of the black hole, okay? You, you remember the, the spectrum of the BTZ, right? Yes, if you go to M and J, okay, it goes up to zero, and then, and then you have to go to, to minus, to negative M's to get the ADS3, which is the asymptotic behavior. Okay, if you go in this limit, that's how the, this, uh, uh, so this uh, BTZ in the, uh, in the zero limit, say, that it looks like. So this, um, um, the, this uh, so the situation for finding a candidate for this RG in two plus one dimension is the following. When M is different from zero, we take, we take the, I have five minutes. Okay, uh, so if if m is different, the, the, the this the, is not zero. Okay, you can take as the gravitational radius the event horizon, which you write in this fashion. When m is, is equal to zero, uh, you don't have to put m equal to zero here, so you get zero. Okay, you you go back, you find the different metric, you take the ds zero, and you say, ah, okay, my gravitational radius is this one. Okay, so this is what it comes from from the theory. Okay, and this stuff you can think of applying. To, to the cosmos, okay, out there, uh, and, and the fundamental language. But uh, the question now to answer is, what is L from the physical point of view? And Graphene has a beautiful answer, which I'm gonna show it to you uh, step by step, okay? So this is the, the part of the talk where I'll be, you know, let me say, I, I'll show you step by step all, 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 all what I say. So take J equals zero BTZ. The J equals zero BTZ is conformal to the hyperbolic pseudosphere times R. Which is, which is, this stuff is, has got this, this uh, uh, negative constant Gaussian curvature. The line element of the, of the hyperbolic pseudosphere is written in here, okay? Where, as I said, R is constant and C is constant. There are two constants in the game, and these are uh, the angles, okay? So phi is the, excuse me, the, phi is the angle and U is the longitudinal variable. Okay, uh, so the radial coordinates, okay, you can write it this way. Remember, this is after the revolution. So typical thing is du squared, the radial coordinate squared times the phi, d phi squared. And that's how the radial coordinates looks like, okay? And you have a maximum and a minimum. The minimum is over here, the maximum is over here, okay? So minimal radius over here, maximum radius over here. Okay, for reasons that if you like, uh, I can tell you, I mean, uh, I, I like to call this thing the Hilbert horizon, the maximal, although this is not an horizon in the general relativistic sense, it is actually a boundary. Okay, and now setting this constant to one so that we don't clutter the notation, you take the very same metric I showed before, and with few steps, you show that it's conformal to this one. Okay, as simple as that, where the L pops up. Fine. Now, define this new coordinates, du, right in this way. Okay, and this row of R written this way, from which you can rewrite this is a simple integration uh, equation to integrate. You, you can write R as a function of U in this fashion. You put it back into rho of R. You have rho of R of U, rho of U. Good, that's the end of the story. Ha! Huh. But then you know that this L, this, this L we we're looking for in this contest, we realize the stuff uh, in the way I said, it's gonna be C. And C is the minimum of this, uh, uh, of the value of the rho. So it's, it's where this thing becomes slimmer, okay, in here. And it will be here, it will be here, and so on and so forth. So there is another ingredient you want to put in, which is the fact that for these structures to actually reach the event horizon, for this Hilbert horizon to reach the event horizon, you need to go in this limit. Okay, fine. So if you actually, oh, excuse me. So this means that if you realize the stuff with graphene, you can now go beyond this lattice spacing. So the most natural definition is that this L is little L itself. Okay, so in graphene, you write the BTZ in the form I wrote here, and everything is given in terms of these variables, which you can measure and you have it in your, in your hands. The radius of curvature and the lattice spacing. Now you wanna see that why you wanna go to that limit, why you need to go to the limit, because if you take the radius of the Hilbert horizon, you see that it's, uh, uh, you can re-express it in terms of the radius of the event horizon through this formula. You just, uh, you know, for instance, one way to see it, is that if R, the radius of curvature is 10 to the N L, this formula approximates to this nice thing to write. And so if you take, I don't know, N equal thousand, so R equal thousand L, this thing is, is very, very small. And so, and, uh, no, it's consistent. Okay, so the references for that is this paper, uh, 2020. 
uh, with uh, uh, these two gentlemen, which are experts of the GUP, uh, my strict collaborator on the on the on this uh, uh, graphene story, which is actually a common student. He was the was now he's a doctor, a common PhD student of mine, and and Jorge Zanelli. Uh, and so this is some credits. This is Pablo, which I was mentioning. Um, Gaetano is, uh, as I said, among uh, the experts of GUP. Luca is also participating into that as my postdoc at the moment. Giovanni left some time ago. Um, this um, Marcello is in the in the experimental part. This is a student. Uh, Paolo is an old collaborator in the whole general area of, of uh, analogs. And I'd like to mention uh, the fond memory of Martin Schultz, who's been a young collaborator and he contributed quite a lot to the story, although in a different perspective, but, but left us uh, very early. Okay, so last very last uh, thing is that uh, um, I'm involved into this uh, quantum gravity phenomenology universe uh, issue. Uh, the, the deadline and which I, I invite you to contribute. We have this uh, um, distinguished colleagues who contributed or are about to contribute and uh, the deadline is, is still is still quite far so you can think of uh, giving us a hand. Thank you very much. Fascinating talk. So are there any questions here? To get an analog, you necessarily always have to take JC. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't get what you say. Uh, do you always have to take J is equal to zero? Or? J, J equals zero. No, no, not at all. Not at all. You can, you can, um, this is the simplest, the simplest uh, uh, situation. You can think of, oh, no, 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 you, you can take it non zero in general. In general. Actually, uh, uh, how the BTZ, can I, can I use this? There's something to erase. Okay. Okay. So I'll. I'll, I'll so the BTZ uh, spectrum, as you might remember, is like that, right? Okay. So you have an M. You have M over here, J over here. Okay. And here you have something like M squared plus J squared is equal to one, something like that. Okay. Uh, and so this is for M positive, and this is where M equals zero is sitting. Okay, fine. But then you can go, you can go, so it's, it's actually all this area here is, is of interest. So you can actually, if you are J equals zero, M equals zero, you're here. Otherwise you can go, you can go into, into this region and you're still, you're still uh, on board, let's say. But in any case, no, you don't have to. You, you have no, no uh, limitations on the, on the system. You just have to you have to envisage when you want to give a rotation to, to, to the system. Okay, how, how actually to practically implement that? But isn't this area the area that doesn't have a horizon? Not I don't hear. Um, this area particular uh, you might have a horizon, is it? You have a horizon in the end of the spectrum. Yes, that's what you have the horizon here. Yes, and this is this is the particle. But you reach, you see, you reach the uh, asymptotic, the ADS tree, you reach over here. Okay. And, uh, sorry, I have other questions, maybe I can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the people who are here have plenty of time to discuss anyway afterwards with Alfredo. Are there any the what are have. important questions here from Kofu? Brief questions. And for the online people, because the online people don't have much other opportunities, are there any questions question online? No, no. Yeah, I don't see any questions online. Okay, so let's thank the speaker for the I suggest to, to put it up maybe afterwards because it's already quite late. Thanks a lot, Alfredo. Thank you. And the next speaker is online, Xavier Calmet. Do I see Xavier? I don't see. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Um, so let's maybe either postpone Xavier or 
Um, Alex TV, the next speaker would be Toby Wiseman, also online. Who is here? Yes. So I, I would just ask, Toby, can you start your talk now? Or do, maybe we should probably give him the. Hi, uh, right. yeah. C can you hear me? Yes, very good. Yes, yes. Uh, let me, um, right, let me figure out. <laughs> Sorry, this is a bit earlier than I thought. <laughs> let me share my screen. Okay, uh, great. Can you, can you see this? Um, well, the title is Holography and the, and the Lattice. Fantastic. So, can, you see the, can you see this pointer? That's right for questions. Uh, can you see the pointer moving here? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Great. Okay, well, um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. I have no doubt that Corfu is nicer than London at the moment, so uh, um, I'm very much uh, sad not to be there with you. Um, I'm going to talk um, uh, a little bit about uh, using uh, holography to test ideas in quantum gravity via lattice quantum field theory, and I'll explain how and why that works. And um, I'll review some old, uh, some old work and also talk about some more recent work. But um, I'm hoping this will be uh, probably lots of people are not familiar with all the ideas. So I'm ho hopefully this will be sort of introduce some of the basic aspects. Uh, and I'd like to thank um, my collaborators, um, Simon Catterall, Joel Geet, Anosh Joseph, uh, Raghav Jar, and David Sheikh, um, particularly Raghav and David, who've done a lot of work on the numerical side of the recent, more recent work I'll talk about later. Um, so, uh, a plan for the talk, I'll talk about uh, holography um, and how it allows us to relate certain quantum field theories to certain quantum gravities, and therefore will allow us, in fact, how to access black hole thermodynamics, which is a quantum phenomenon, we believe, a fully quantum phenomenon. So we'll access black hole thermodynamics using um, our ability to solve these strongly coupled quantum field theories via the lattice. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some instances where we're able to make some progress doing this. It's a hard problem, but there's definitely been a lot of progress over the last uh, sort of decade. And I'll talk about some uh, the sort of simplest instance where this happens, which um, is not the usual ADS-CFT correspondence everyone's familiar with. It's a simpler quantum mechanical setting. And then I'll talk about some higher dimensional uh, versions of this correspondence. Um, but as I only have a short time and I want to leave a bit of time for questions, um, I'll necessarily go fairly quickly. So apologies for skipping over some details. So right back to the basics, uh, holography, uh, Maldasena taught us that certain, um, uh, th there's many instances nowadays of holography, but going right back to the beginning, Maldasena claimed that uh, by thinking about DP brains in string theory, um, one realizes that maximally supersymmetric Yang Mills at large N uh, with sort of UN or SUN gauge group in P plus one dimensions is believed to be physically equivalent to a string theory, a closed string theory in the decoupling limit of N DP brains. Now that string theory may, depending on the parameters, have a supergravity description uh, or at least be well approximated by supergravity, I should say. Um, and uh, we're going to think about putting the system at finite temperature. And the reason is it's in a sense, it's the simplest deformation of the vacuum of these theories that one can make or a, a very simple one. And it allows us to study black holes, uh, which is sort of principally my interest. And, and when one does that, what the statement is that finite temperature super Yang mills, um, is really describing these hot DP brains and can be thought of either as this sort of gas of thermal uh, Yang Mills gluons doing their thing, strongly interacting, or can be thought of as some sort of, as in certain limits at least, a string theory, D brains at finite temperature all sitting on top of each other, which can be described by some sort of supergravity black hole. Um, these black holes are a little bit uh, well, I mean, they're relatively straightforward to write down. Um, I'll write a metric in a second. Um, 
they have a, a, an asymptotically flat region and then a, a sort of near, uh, near horizon geometry. And when one takes the decoupling limit, what one's doing is focusing in near the horizon because near the horizon, there are low energy degrees of freedom trapped in the throat of this very long horizon, um, uh, which, uh, whose dynamics is sort of stuck there. And it's those degrees of freedom that are described by the super Yang Mills. That's the claim. We'll be interested in large n limit because that's where we will recover a super gravity description here. And an important point is that at large n, as probably everyone's familiar, it's not the Yang Mills coupling that's the, the relevant perturbation parameter, but the Tuft coupling, this combination of n and g Yang Mills squared. Um, but in particular, this Tuft coupling is dimensionful when you're not in three dimensions of space. So when we talk about ADS-CFT, we usually talk about D3 brains and then everything's dimensionless. And it turns out this uh, Supiang Mills theory is actually beautifully a conformal field theory, but in the versions that I'm interested in, it's not going to be. Actually, there's a classical scaling of the coupling. So I'm interested in the case of P less than three. And in this instance, when one focuses on this near horizon decoupled region, um, what one finds when one looks at the supergravity, which you can write down very explicitly, you can ask, does it describe the system well? Now, it turns out as you go into what would be uh, the UV of the geometry, you see just like in ADS-CFT, a conformal boundary. But the difference with ADS-CFT is that as you go towards the conformal boundary, the supergravity description breaks down because of alpha prime corrections. And this doesn't happen in ADS-CFT because of the conformal symmetry, the scaling symmetry, but here it does. And it's really just the expression that for P less than three, these Yang-Mills theories are weakly coupled in the UV. And we don't expect when we have weakly coupled theories there to be a good gravity dual, or rather it would be remarkable if there was. That's what we're sort of looking for, but, um, but there, there isn't in this case anyway. Now, um, so we have to stay away from the boundary, but that's okay. We can look at lower energies in the geometry. And um, on the other hand, as we go to too low energy, uh, we actually hit the problem that the dilaton, which in this geometry runs, becomes large, meaning that string coupling corrections become large and, and ruin the supergravity description far in the infrared. But that's okay, because if we put the system at finite temperature, what happens is we develop a horizon at some fixed uh, finite position, if you like, here in this throat, and that cuts off, at least at, if we go to large enough n, that cuts off the region where stringy corrections would be important. And then we can have a, a, the region near the horizon, well, for a long distance above the horizon, described by supergravity, and in particular by some metric that you can explicitly write down. And th this is the idea. And so the question is, if we understand the geometry of this horizon and, and near the black hole, we can calculate its thermodynamics. In fact, Maldesena did this years ago. And the question is, well, can we recover that by looking at this gauge theory here at finite temperature? So the theories are very explicit. One can write them down. There's some you know, simple field theory. You have uh, nine minus P scalar uh, matrices that transform in the adjoint, the N by N matrices. And you have some fermions as well that transform in the adjoint. Uh, and a gauge, this is gauged. Um, but in principle, it's extremely well-defined. Um, we can define, uh, if we're at finite temperature, a dimensionless temperature in units of the Tuft coupling, remembering that we're not, we're in the case P less than three, so the Tuft coupling is dimension full, so we can uh, use it to dimensionalize things. You can't do this, obviously, in the usual ADS-CFT case, uh, P equals three, but for P less than three, you can. So we can talk about the temperature, the dimension as temperature in units of the Tuft coupling, the dimension as energy density. And it turns out when one looks at when the black hole at large N is, um, when the horizon is such that it's not corrected by alpha prime corrections, um, it means that the temperature can't be too large. So this dimensionless temperature here, if we take the strict large N limit, this dimensionless temperature should be small um, order n to the zero, but small numerically, maybe a thousandth or a millionth or whatever you like, but n has gone to infinity. 
And in that case, Maldasena taught us that the energy density should, when you calculate it from the supergravity, have this form. So there's a very precise prediction. And in particular, it goes like n squared, which actually isn't obvious because this is a strongly coupled theory um, and has some very particular scaling uh, or unusual scaling with this temperature. And just something to note here that I think it's important to emphasize the entropy, which you can just calculate trivially from this energy, the entropy goes to zero as you take temperature to zero, okay? What that means is um, that the entropy or the thermodynamics of this black hole is something that is uh, not associated to ground state degeneracy, but is really associated to finite temperature. And I say that because of course, there's been beautiful progress in Strominger of Affa and in recent years, uh, many uh, beautiful works doing precise mathematical counting of entropy of black holes and string theory. But those countings are always of um, supersymmetric ground states. And so the entropy is coming from ground state degeneracy, not from thermal physics. Uh, the thermal physics here completely breaks supersymmetry. So in a sense, if we can reproduce black hole thermodynamics here, that's due to finite temperature, it's a very different test of consistency of, uh, of, of string theory and consistency of um, the, the sort of quantum gravity that it's defining uh, versus the um, very beautiful analytic but um, uh, studies of ground state degeneracy where everything's still supersymmetric. So just in pictures, um, we have this dimensionless temperature. We've taken n to infinity. This is our dimensionless temperature. When t is small, that's the regime where this throat becomes long and we have a good region here where we can control the solution with uh, 2a or 2b gravity and we can calculate predictions. If t becomes too large, the horizon goes up towards the UV and then it becomes uh, corrected by alpha prime corrections. And we don't really know how to deal with that. Um, non-perturbatively non in alpha um, in T. So we don't have a prediction here. It will be interesting to understand whether one could understand that, but uh, certainly currently we can't. So we'll focus on this. So um, the key concepts here are that at low energies, low temperatures, the gauge theory is strongly coupled. We have to put it on a lattice. The lattice allows us a way to calculate at finite temperature rather conveniently. So one goes to Euclidean time here um, and Euclidean time, we, we wrap up into a period, a circle of period beta and beta becomes the inverse temperature. And so what we want to do is simulate this Euclidean theory um, on the lattice with this periodic time. And we use Monte Carlo important sampling techniques to do that as is standard. Um, of course, because we have supersymmetry, we have fermions and we have to be a little bit careful how we deal with them. And we also have to be careful that one recovers the correct continuum physics because the lattice, when you break supersymmetry, uh, you can introduce relevant operators that, that uh, don't flow away in the infrared and actually destroy the uh, supersymmetric continuum limit. And so it turns out that, um, in fact, uh, we showed this ages ago on the lattice, uh, when you look at the very low dimensional example, P equals zero, which I'll focus on in a minute, these problems sort of go away. Fermions become trivial and you don't have to worry about the continuum limit. However, in higher dimensions, you have to worry. And um, in order to do this, you need to use some sort of um, formulation of lattice gauge theory that preserves some supersymmetry on the lattice. And my collaborators, Simon Catterall, uh, Joel Geet and so on, have some very elegant um, work over many years now uh, showing how to do that. So that's been a big area of lattice uh, research. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, this uh, lowest dimensional case, P equals zero. This is the old fashioned um, BFSS model of matrix theory, Banks, Fischer, Schenker, Suskind, here it is. Um, and so at low temperature, T much less than one, dimensionless temperature, we have an explicit prediction for how the energy should go. At high temperature, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't correspond to black hole physics. And in fact, energy must go like temperature just on dimensional grounds. And there are some simple observables in this theory. There's the energy density itself, which you can calculate on the lattice fairly straightforwardly. Um, there's also the Polyakov loop. So we have a Euclidean time circle and you can calculate the holonomy 
of the gauge field around the Euclidean time circle. And Witten argued a long time ago that the eigenvalues of the Polyakov loop or this holonomy, which are um, phases that sit on a, a unit circle, the distribution of those phases tells you about whether the circle in the dual gravity is contractible or not. And so in particular, he says that if the distribution of eigenvalues is not uniform, then uh, the circle should be contractible. And if it's uniform, it shouldn't be. Uh, this was not a very old argument of Witten. And so by looking at this holonomy and looking at its eigenvalues, you can, you can uh, diagnose uh, whether the uh, dual uh, theory, the dual gravity theory um, has a horizon or not. Um, there is a subtlety, which I think in the interest of time, I'm happy to say more about, but I think I'm just going to skip um, the subtlety. And that is just to say, we have to really think about going to large N. And one of the reasons is that um, the, uh, firstly, the predictions for supergravity only apply at large N. But more importantly, in fact, these, um, uh, when you're at finite N, it turns out uh, that the thermodynamics of the system is ill, Ill behaved. At large N, the thermodynamics or the thermal state is metastable. It's not completely stable. Um, and in the end, it will decay. If you prepared a, a, a sort of a thermal looking state and let it go, in the end, it would decay. Um, and it decays, uh, if one thinks about the, uh, this theory representing uh, D-brain dynamics, so D0 brains in this case, what happens is all the D-brains are interacting very strongly, sort of thermally. And then uh, if you leave them for a long time, a D-brain will pop out and uh, head off to infinity. And then another one will pop out and head off to infinity. And this lump of uh, interacting thermal D0 brains actually in the end evaporates off. And um, so one way of saying that is that these D brains can leave uh, the decoupled region, um, if you like. Uh, they sort of hawking radiate away uh, from this decoupled region. Um, now, at large enough n, that effect is very much suppressed. And so if we can reach large n, we won't see it. And it's that metastable large n behavior that we're after. Um, now, going way back uh, a decade and a half now, there was sort of early work by myself and Simon Catterall and by uh, one of our uh, organizers, uh, Konstantinos, uh, beautiful work with himself, uh, Jun Nishimura, um, uh, Masanori Hanada, who'll be speaking later in the meeting, I think about something else, um, and collaborators, and they, they really did some wonderful work. And uh, we were both looking at this P equals zero theory. Um, here we're plotting energy over temperature. Here this is just energy, but they're the same thing, really. This is the dimension as temperature. And what both our uh, simulations showed is that as you approach low temperature, so here, this is high temperature up here, but as we come down, these points are approaching this, this curve I've sort of shaded green, and that's the prediction that at low temperature, supergravity gives. Over here, perhaps, I uh, or equivalently here, um, we have, again, the sort of zoom in. Here, we're at relatively high temperatures, but here, as we come down to lower temperatures, the, the points start bending around, and they're they're becoming compatible with this low temperature um, supergravity prediction, the same thing here. And so it really did seem rather remarkably that we were recovering this rather strange thermal behavior in this quantum mechanics. Um, more recently, there's been beautiful work uh, improving this. Masanori Hanada and his group uh, have done some really uh, very impressive uh, quantum mechanics calculations. Um, uh, Philip and O'Connor, Kado and Kamata all have done, uh, again, beautiful, much uh, simulations of much larger N up to sort of Ns of 30 or more. Um, and again, the same, th the same thing is seen, essentially. This, this recovery, here we are, this is a, a very nice figure here, the same here. This recovery as we come down towards this green curve, you can ignore these other curves. Here we've got the data points and they're approaching this green curve. That's the important one. That's the supergravity one. Here they're looking at Subleading corrections for how you deviate away as you go up to higher temperature. To my mind, that's uninteresting. 
The really interesting thing is that you land on this curve because this curve is really quantum gravity. This is the thermodynamics of black holes and it's a fully quantum. I mean, of course we can calculate it classically. That's the magic of general relativity, semi-classical general relativity, but that entropy, that thermodynamics arises fully quantum mechanically. Okay, it's very important to understand that. That's a totally non-perturbative quantum phenomena, that green curve there that one's landing on. So very remarkable. Now, what about the other cases of P? That was quantum mechanics, P equals zero. Let's think about high dimensional cases. So we can go to P equals one or two. Let me focus on P equals one for a minute, but I'll end with some P equals two. P equals one, we're now in a quantum field theory. So it's a one plus one quantum field theory and there's been much less work. So a number of groups around the world have now looked at this quantum mechanics case and, it's, and, and we get beautifully consistent results. But in the high dimensional cases, there's, there's re very little work. Um, now, um, in one plus one, one of the, one of the um, uh, typically when you look at a field theory on the lattice, you're always worried that you're, you're interested in sort of in flat space and you can't put flat space in a computer, you have to compactify it. And then when you compactify it, you worry that you've introduced finite volume effects and you're not really simulating flat space. One of the very nice things about the physics here in one plus one is that uh, actually, even when you compactify space into say a circle, so time is now a Euclidean time circle, space is a Euclidean circle, there's still a supergravity dual. So even though you've compactified it, that's fine. Uh, it's a real physical deformation that you can be interested in this compactification. So that's rather nice. Um, and we can take advantage of that to vary the size of the circle and see what the physics does. And as, I, as I'll tell you, there's some interesting physics. So now we've got two dimensionless couplings. We've got temperature or inverse temperature, uh, which we can make dimensionless in one plus one by the square root of lambda like this. So this is a dimensionless, R beta here is a dimensionless coupling. And RL is a dimensionless coupling now associated to the size of the space circle. So it's like a torus. And of course, now we can look both at the holonomy of the gauge field around the time circle to diagnose whether that's contractible, which from a Euclidean point of view means there's a horizon, and also whether the space circle is contractible um, by looking at its holonomy. And that diagnoses whether the space circle is contractible in the bulk, which tells you something about the, the topology of the solution. Now, what does gravity predict? Well, the gravity picture is a little bit more rich in higher dimensions. Um, so when we have this circle, uh, this, is, this is a slightly complicated and old story. So I just want to say it very quickly and um, I can give people a reference if you want more information. But it's really, all I want you to take away is that the situation is richer, there's more to see. Uh, in the Supiang mills, uh, you've got the circle now that you can vary its size in units of the tuff coupling and you can vary temperature as well. The usual uh, dual is, is say we're in one plus one, that's D1 brains. The usual supergravity dual is 2B. And in 2B, um, when we're at finite temperature, this, the dual black hole, just wraps trivially on the circle. It's what we call a homogeneous black string. And when we talk about black strings on circles, you think, oh, Gregory Laflamme instability, but there is no Gregory Laflamme instability here. And there's no instability because this black hole has charge. It has D1 brain charge and D1 brain charge winds around the circle and you can't break it. So it stabilizes the solution. However, because it's on a circle, you can t dualize And when you t dualize uh, this solution, it becomes a solution in 2A with exactly the same thermodynamics. It's, it's just that um, trivially related. Um, but now the important difference is that the, what was a winding D1 charge becomes a smeared D0 charge, but this is a new type of charge that can redistribute on the circle. And that can allow for an instability where the uh, black hole wants to uh, redistribute its position on the circle. And in fact, what you find when you do a detailed analysis is that when the circle is small, it's very happy to be uh, as it was here, the same thing. But actually when you make the circle large, it doesn't want to be this solution, the t dual of this, it wants to be a different solution. It actually wants to localize on the circle. And there's a phase transition as you make the circle bigger here, which you can only see in this 2A picture. Anyway, that's a long story, 
But in particular, the uh, signature in the Supiang mills is that you expect there to be a transition in the behavior of the eigenvalues of this uh, Polyakov loop or this holonomy around the spatial circle. So that you'll expect a change in the eigenvalues. And in particular, what you expect is that as the eigen, as you take n to be large, so you have an infinite number of eigenvalues in the large n limit, uh, in this phase here, the large circle phase, you expect a homogeneous distribution for the eigenvalues. And in the small circle phase, you expect an inhomogeneous distribution, or in fact, a localized distribution. So as we vary these two couplings, uh, inverse temperature and uh, the size of the circle, we expect there to be some um, phase transition uh, at, at low temperature or large thermal circle size up here. We expect there to be a gravity description. If we're at too high temperature, we don't have a gravity description, just like in the quantum mechanics. At low temperature, we have a gravity description, but there are two phases depending on the size of the circle here. And actually this, the gravity prediction for this was calculated in a very impressive uh, or sort of very impressive um, numerical relativity work on the gravity side of this correspondence. So we actually even have a prediction where this should be. So just quickly in the last couple of minutes, um, a long time ago, myself and Anos Joseph did some, um, did some simulation of this one plus one system, but we could only reach small ends of uh, three and four. But more recently with uh, David and Raghav, we went up to bigger ends ends of eight, which are starting to get sufficient to see large n behavior um, uh, and even some larger ends. And what we did see was evidence of a phase transition. So uh, these, this line here is the gravity prediction. These points here with the error bars are estimates from our lattice data of where we felt by looking at the Polyakov line around the spatial circle, looking at when there was a transition in the behavior of the eigenvalues. And you can see there's some big error bars and it becomes difficult when the, uh, when the, when the torus becomes large you, you need lots of lattice points to resolve what's going on essentially, and it becomes harder, but you certainly see consistency with this gravity um, here, uh, which is quite nice. Um, furthermore, we can actually study the um, thermal behavior of the two phases. So here's an example. This is the prediction, this dashed line. This is as we're coming down to low temperature um, in one phase and in the other. And they give reasonable agreement. There are still big errors, but reasonable agreement. And in particular, um, you can look at the eigenvalues of this Polyakov line as a function of n for these two phases. And indeed, in this phase, which should be the homogeneous one, you see that as n increases, it's difficult to see actually here with it, and uh, probably uh, your eyes won't be able to see this, but what is happening as you increase n is the distribution is becoming flatter. So it, as you would go to larger n, it looks like it's becoming more homogeneous, whereas if here it's doing the opposite, it's becoming more localized, which is what we expected from the gravity. Um, uh, there was some nice work I just wanted to mention by Cadeau. This is the only um, other work looking at the system um, um, which looked at just the homogeneous phase and again also saw a consistency with the thermodynamic predictions of supergravity. And finally, going to one plus two, just recently myself, um, uh, Simon, Joel, Raghav and David looked at the one plus two case, which is a cons again, a, an even harder problem. Uh, but um, because of some pretty impressive work from uh, David Raghav, uh, we managed to look at N of eight, up to N of eight. And again, um, we, we didn't look, we couldn't scan the space of different torus sizes to see this phase transition, or we haven't done that yet. Um, but we were just looking in what we would have been the homogeneous phase. And we were able to see a consistency with the thermodynamic predictions from supergravity. And in particular, here's high temperature, here are our points. Here's low temperature, here are our points. Actually, the high temperature behavior, this yellow curve and the low temperature behavior, this dash curve, look rather similar on this graph. Um, and so, I mean, the points uh, are consistent with uh, both, in fact, because they look rather similar. But of course, one could, you know, they could have done something completely different. So at least at low temperature, they are, they do look, this is a sort of zoom in slightly um, and not a log scale. They look like they're becoming consistent with this, uh, the dash line, the gravity prediction but the error bars are still pretty large. But most importantly, at low temperature, 
as we increase n, the eigenvalue distribution is becoming flatter, which is what we would expect. It's the homogeneous phase. Um, anyway, so this is the sort of state of the art at the moment. There's uh, clearly much to improve on. Uh, where to go now, obviously with more time and effort, you can do a better job with more computing power in the future. I expect uh, the simulations will become better, just like the quantum mechanics ones did. Um, but a, a big question is what new observables should we be looking at rather than just the thermodynamics? I mean, there's been a lot of interest, for example, in understanding whether entanglement entropy tells us about geometry emerging. How do we do that in these systems? And um, can we develop a better understanding for why gravity behavior is seen? I mean, this is the old problem and there's been relatively little progress on that. The lattice, um, I'm not saying the lattice will help us do that, but if there are ideas uh, in how gravity emerges, maybe the lattice can help us test those ideas. Anyway, that's uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Sure, uh, questions here in, Go through, yes, please. I have a few questions. The first one is uh, 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 in one plus one and one plus two dimension, how big is a finite end correction? Maybe it's uh, smaller than zero plus one dimensional case. Maybe you can go closer to larger limit more easily because there is a volume factor. It's just a maybe naive hope. Um. That's an interesting question. I, I have to say, I, I'm not sure I can tell you off the top of my head how the one over n corrections compare between the one plus two, one plus one, and one plus zero cases. Um, but you're just saying, you're saying essentially there are more degrees of freedom on the lattice, so you would expect um, smaller one over n corrections. Is that the idea? Yes, yes, but uh, yeah, of course I don't have a uh, stronger logic, but I just thought maybe one way in the collection is like one way anytime small volume or something like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure. I would have to look in more detail. That's an interesting question. Sorry. Is that Masanori? Uh, yes. Ah, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually we are neighbor, but no, we are far away. <laughs> uh, and the second question was about the uh, black hole, black string transition. Uh, you mentioned the paper by Oscar Diaz, uh, George Santos, and Bason Way, but I thought you already had uh, some gravity, good gravity analysis back in 2003 or 2004. So I wonder what was the improvement? No, what, what, uh, what we did way back then was calculate the Gregory Laflamme transition point. Gregory, um, you mean you matched the free energy or you looked at the uh, Gregory so Laflamme? Looking at the, uh, just the linear, instability in gravity but the point is because it's a first order transition that doesn't tell you the phase transition temperature mm -hmm. By phase um, so to find the phase transition temperature actually you need to find the stable phase the localized phase and then look at its free energy and compare it to the unstable phase so the so the transition, so there's a, the, the temperature at the uh, point where the linear instability of the homogeneous phase sets in is, um, is not the phase transition temperature. Uh, okay, so related- Because it's a first order transition. Related to that, I was wondering the transition temperature you measured on lattice, that was, which was a counterpart and whether that subtlety associated with the first order nature of which phase transition can explain that deviation. Um, uh, sorry, can you say that again? First, uh, phase, uh, phase transition is the first order, I suppose. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. So, I, uh, in that sense, on that is uh, identifying a phase transition, it's not very easy with, whether you're looking at the instability point or where free energy becomes the same. That such ambiguity may explain this deviation, I thought. Um, well, the de uh, oh, hang on. Um, the deviation here. Um, you mean this deviation? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I think the honest truth is, once you're at relatively low temperatures, it, it just became very difficult to see the transition clearly enough. I mean, we just had big error bars here, and so I'm not quite sure. Uh, I mean, the errors are sufficiently large that um, I'm not sure. Uh, down here, I would say you're still at too low a temperature to be agreeing with the supergravity well. 
And uh, uh, clearly here we've got huge error bars. I mean, you really want some points up here. This is just the asset. This is the asset. I mean, this is this curve is is a sort of curve you should trust asymptotically at low temperature. So of course the points could march up here to the right and still be consistent with it at very large uh, circle size. So I, I wouldn't claim that we had a discrepancy, uh, certainly in that 2017 work. I would more claim that we've got a fairly big error bar on what the lattice says the temperature is. So you're hoping it comes back close to that red line at the... Well, it may, it, I, I don't know. I mean, it, yeah, I have, I mean, I would, I'm not sure I have any right to hope one thing or the other. <laughs> but certainly I don't, I mean, presumably if, if the gravity analysis is correct and holography is correct, it will somehow stay close to that line right up to very, very large circle sizes, very large thermal circle sizes. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any more urgent questions here? I don't see any in Kofu. Are there online questions? Yes, there are in fact even two. Uh, all right, uh, uh, June Nishimura, please. Uh, yeah, I have a naive question about your description of the Gregory Laflamme transition. You said that in the 2B picture, there is no such instability, but if you go to T dual picture, you have instability. In, uh, wh why can that be true? And because also, yeah. is the T duality broken in some? No, so, some sorry, I, I went. I went very quickly. Um, yeah. The slide usually takes a while to describe. Sorry. Uh -huh. So the, the idea is that when you go, when you do a T duality, string modes and, and momentum modes swap. Uh -huh. So in the two B gravity, you don't see an in, an unstable mode. Mm -hmm. When you do the T-duality in 2A, you see an unstable gravity mode. And then what that tells you, thinking back in the 2B, well, what was the instability? It must be there because they're T-dual, they're the same mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be a stringy winding mode. That's, uh -huh. that's the idea. So uh -huh. you, you couldn't see it uh, by thinking about gravity because it, in the 2B picture, it was really a stringy winding mode that was becoming uh -huh. unstable and condensing. Uh -huh. I see. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. And hello. Yeah. Okay, and then there was another question, I think, by Arthur Hebeck. Maybe if you can keep it short. Uh, yes, so very short. I have a very naive... Sorry, you, you can't see me, right? Uh, we can hear you. But... Good, that's maybe good enough. So I have a very naive outsider's question. Um, can you somehow... Even in principle, I mean, even if you give, I give you all technical possibilities uh, that you could dream of, uh, contribute through your analysis to the black hole information paradox. I mean, actually inform the gravity side about how the information uh, comes out of the black hole. Is there any way, uh, I mean, what kind of questions could you ask in your context in the far future to help with that problem? Yeah, so I think, um, so for the black hole information problem, um, one would really want to look at time evolution. And as I'm sure you very well know, that's a much harder problem uh, to simulate numerically. You would really be looking at simulating, a, I guess, evolving a Schrodinger problem for this uh, Super Yang Mills. So in principle, if you had huge resources, you might be able to do that. Uh, at the moment, time evolution is really restricted to the classical um, say in this quantum mechanical case, people have done classical dynamical simulations, but not quantum ones. Um, but if you had huge resources, you could think, well, I'll just write down the Schrodinger equation for this quantum mechanics um, at large n. I'll start with some wave packet, or, or you know, some wave function rather, um, which perhaps represents something before a gravitational collapse to a black hole. Um, uh, or some data that would thermalize. And then you could ask, okay, well, when it collapses to form some approximately thermal state, firstly, does it look like a black hole? And presumably it will, because we're seeing um, the correct behavior for these equili in this equilibrium setting. But then you, in principle, would be able to just watch it for a very long time and watch it evaporate by Hawking radiation. 
And um, presumably, uh, you know, well, assuming the information isn't lost, that would be what happens. So the, the black hole would evaporate and you would be left with just hot, a hot graviton gas. And if that was happening, that would confirm the expectation that in holography, uh, black holes evaporate in a unitary manner and that no information is lost. And then in principle, uh, I mean, what we really don't have a very good handle on is recovering uh, geometry from the data in the Yang-Mills theory. And um, that's both a, a problem you need to be able to solve the Yang Mills theory, say using the lattice or whatever. Um, but you also, uh, th there's just analytic understanding that's missing. You know, people are using ideas of entanglement entropy, but there isn't a sharp way to say, this is how to recover what the, the geometry is. And if you could put both those together, then in principle, you could say, okay, yes, indeed, we see flat space come out. We see some gas of quantum Hawking uh, qu quanta on top of that. And then we've confirmed, you may even be able to recover how the geometry emerges. But that's far off from what we're capable of. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we had a pretty good discussion. So let's thank Toby again for his nice contribution. Thank you. And I understand that Xavier did not show up. In which case, I think we can move to the next talk by Emilian Floraotos. Yes. Emmanuel. Um, okay, we need two minutes. Okay, uh, so our next speaker will be Emmanuel Floratos, and the title of the talk is The Arithmetic Geometry of Ages 2 and the Continuum Limit. Please, Please, 25 plus 5 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's uh, extremely nice to start again normal life, or semi-normal life, after the coronavirus epidemic. And I'm very happy to be again back in Corfu. Since I follow from time to time all the efforts here, the local efforts for the success of this uh, conference, which is, which is uh, uh, growing and growing, and I hope it will become a permanent uh, for, for during all the year for many different disciplines. Uh, as you know, there are efforts to make the, the permanent institute here in Mon Repo, uh, thanks to George and uh, uh, other people who helped this effort. I think it's very important for Greece and uh, for science, uh, uh, for the young people in Greece, and also for all the, all, all the friends and collaborators from all, all, all the world they were. Okay. So my talk today will be very simple uh, study uh, uh, for the arithmetic geometry of the Adidasitor space-time in two dimensions. And uh, I will explain the word, what means arithmetic, and uh, its continuum limit. 
So this is a, a work which has been published recently. Uh, Okay, so uh, uh, the plan of the seminar is uh, uh, as follows. First, we'll discuss uh, what is exactly the problem and uh, what is the motivation to study this problem because it's a, this concrete uh, work uh, is a mathematical work, I would say, but it has motivation uh, in, from physics. And uh, then, uh, 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 I will pass uh, to discuss uh, where it is relevant, this uh, uh, arithmetic geometry, where we believe it may be relevant for the various problems in, uh, uh, in black scale physics, and especially in uh, near uh, uh, geometry of black holes. Uh, uh, because the model uh, is uh, purely mathematical, I will restrict to very simple ideas to horizon geometry, which is uh, characteristic for the radial and time geometry of extremal black holes, whatever extremal black holes are in four dimensions. Uh, in this case, the uh, geometry near the black hole horizon is factorized and becomes ADS2 cross uh, S2. Uh, for the structured black holes, the near horizon geometry is the Riddler times S2. Now, uh, I will uh, introduce the various cutoffs which are uh, uh, making this geometry, the continuous geometry, uh, make this geometry arithmetic geometry because these cutoffs will not be usual, the usual cutoffs as we know, and uh, will be related to preservation of some of the symmetries that the original geometry had. It is not an arbitrary, and moreover, it has other uh, uh, other uh, good properties. Um, now, this is going to to be discussed in the context of uh, uh, more general uh, uh, more general uh, setting, where you you need to discretize the geometry in such a way so to preserve the geometry of near horizon black hole uh, region in order to preserve uh, many of the properties that uh, you have in uh, in the continuum but uh, uh, something which is not uh, obvious in the continuum is uh, how it's possible to make uh, the continuum ADS2 geometry how to make it random and non-local and this discretization will be random, non-local, and will have a lot of symmetries of the continuum of the continuous. Okay, uh, apparently there is a problem with the transmission to, to Zoom of the slides. So we can see the slides here, but it was not visible so far. Is it not? Okay, now it's okay. Okay, so we, 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 okay, but since the idea was, was okay, I think we can con just continue. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, so this work is based on uh, uh, several recent papers, which I have written with, uh, together with Minos Aksenidis and uh, Stan Nicolis. Uh, Minos Aksenidis is a researcher in uh, uh, the Nuclear Physics Institute in Democritus. Myself, I work also in Democritus and the University of Athens in the Physics Department. And Stan Nicolis, uh, he's uh, in the University of Tours. Okay. Now there are this... Uh, uh, recent uh, four or five years recent papers and uh, we um, are writing now up 
uh, the results we have for uh, uh, introducing coupling between the various uh, simple, uh, the dynamics of uh, simple components uh, of many, many, many body systems falling into the horizon of the black hole, okay, which is <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the previous works, we have, we have studied only the quantum mechanics, the classical quantum mechanics of particles in falling into this random geometry. And uh, in the recent work we have, we look also, in, we found a way to couple all these uh, uh, different uh, chaotic dynamics for each point, okay. Now, the idea is to essentially to try to mimic uh, uh, somehow the, the physical uh, description that originates from the Tuft uh, work on the scattering of ultra high energy scattering on the, on the horizon of a black hole, with due to the Sapir effect, the uh, the particle, when it hits the horizon, it goes in a transverse direction first along the horizon, and then it falls inside the, the inside the black hole. But this, uh, after this has happened, the geometry of the horizon has changed. So there is a memory effect, which is the memory of this translation. And these are what are called super translations in the uh, language of the group, of BMS group of Bonti, Metzner, and Zacks. Okay, so the idea is that uh, the, 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 there is a memory on the horizon. Uh, the memory, uh, this is memory is not lost and the information is not lost, but it is kept through to the um, random changes of the, of the geometry of the horizon. So this work, uh, uh, this idea has taken up uh, much later and uh, people started to look for the, what they are called, um, uh, this um, uh, random geometries uh, by uh, uh, Stanford, Schenker, Maldacena and others. Okay. It is not possible to write, you know, a classical solution with this random geometry in the continuum. Uh, you must take into account some kind of statistical ensemble of these random geometries and uh, work, you cannot work with just one metric. Here, because of the use of the arithmetic geometry, we think that maybe uh, the arithmetic geometry is random enough the way we, we, we do it. So even if you take one out of these uh, generic geometries, this will be somehow the typical uh, a random geometry that you will find, okay? So it's a, it's a kind of trying to mimic uh, a classical random geometry by making arithmetic the geometry of ADS2, but with a very precise mathematical way. Okay, so this, uh, what are the scales where this, uh, we think should happen. This should happen in the scales near the Planck scale. So you are in a region near the horizon, which is in the Planck scale. So all these geometries inside the stress horizon, which a kind of, um, of uh, thick membrane around the horizon uh, with th thickness, the Planck scale. So you have sub plucking structure. This is where we believe may be relevant uh, this uh, arithmetic geometry, okay? Now, if at the Planck scale, uh, you try to condense gravity in some re reasonable semi-classical way, then there are arguments by Harold Kuft that uh, this necessarily leads to the discretization of space-time. Okay. okay, so what is the idea to geometry, this two geometry? So I start the mathematical part, which is trivial for the classical, uh, uh, but we, for the classical geometry, but we, as we shall go on, you will see that we have to do a lot of work. So the, uh, usually they use some people in the uh, ADS-CFT uh, correspondence, they use the Poincare parts, and uh, they use the, the coordinates, which essentially you start 
measuring the distance from the boundary inside the, the black hole, and you separate the coordinates of the, of the... In this separation, the isometry of the, of the ABS2, of the ABS uh, space-time, is very complicated, it's non-linearly realized. Uh, so uh, we prefer a global uh, coordinate system, which is generated by, uh, if, you if you make an intersection of the, of the ABS2 hyperboloid, uh, which is tangent at a point on the neck of the hyperboloid uh, with a plane, then you create the two light cones. And these two light cones, if you rotate this plane, you generate uh, all the, uh, the ABS2 hyperboloid. Uh, and this is a complete uh, embedding system of coordinates. Now, how we, how we do the discretization? Uh, so, the Mikowski, we start with the Mikowski, embedding Mikowski space-time, which is for ADS2 2 plus 1 dimensions, and we use a space-time lattice, so, a uh, uh, cubic uh, lattice, space-time lattice, with lattice spacing A, uh, by taking the physical radius of ADS, dividing by an, uh, an, uh, an integer M, whatever integer you like. Okay. Okay, so if you want a very small uh, large spacing, you must take M very large. Then the equation of the motion of ADS2, the equation of the embedding equation of ADS2, of course, is uh, say uh, 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 x0, x1, x2, x0 squared plus x1 squared are the two times of the Minkowski space time minus x2 squared equals 1, equals r squared, which is the radius. Now, if you uh, take only points of the integral lattice of the embedding Minkowski space-time, some of the points of the integral space-time lattice will lie on the, on, on the hyperboloid. Uh, and then you write, uh, if the coordinates are integer multiples of the lattice spacing, and you put the same in the, in the embedding equation, uh, then you see that you have a set of uh, triples of integers, that they should satisfy k square plus l square minus m square equals m square. Now, because of the indefinite metric, the number of solutions is in infinite. Okay. Now, uh, doing that, we have broken the Minkowski uh, symmetry, so 2, 1, where 2 refers now to the two times, uh, to down to a discrete subgroup of this um, Minkowski uh, symmetry which is the SO, uh, SO, uh, SL2Z. Okay, now uh, SL2, SL2R is the SO21, which is the double covering of SL21, and it is possible to embed the, 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 the three coordinates into a two by two matrix and write the action of uh, SL2 on the left and the right of this matrix to change, to move on this point, or to move on the, on the ADS space time. So the uh, uh, SL2R, which is SL21, uh, uh, becomes uh, SL2Z. Okay, so you find that the, this is the uh, uh, the covering of this. The this is the covering group of SL21Z. So it is the set of three by three matrices, Lorentzian matrices, with integer elements. Okay, now this group is uh, has been studied by mathematicians and uh, especially in the works of Katz because this is the symmetry of the root lattice of the hyperbolic Lie algebra. Okay. So this, uh, uh, it is known that uh, 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 this uh, uh, SO21Z or SL2Z uh, is uh, uh, generated by reflections uh, for SO2Z, we know what it are the generators, but SO21, there are reflections in various hyperplanes, okay? So you find all the integral points of ADS2. And uh, this is a plot of uh, up to some height of the... Uh, uh, now, as you, as you go um, increasing the height, which is the spatial direction, then the number of points uh, is increasing, but the distribution of the number of points is random. 
So this lattice is not a regular lattice because it's induced by the lattice of Minkowski space time. And really it depends very much on the factorization of integers into primes. If you, if you try to solve the equation with integers KLM as, a, as I wrote, then you see that really you have to factorize into primes the various integers. So how many points belong to a certain height around the circle is random. Maybe it's few, then maybe it's very big, few, very big. So the distribution of, of, of space time points. So it's a random lattice. Okay, so that if you want to do the dynamics in the lattice, necessarily it will be a random dynamics, okay? Now the next way, why, uh, why this eliminated periodic atrophy? Now the next step we do, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why some, some equations are disappearing from there, okay? Um, now, the next thing I do is that uh, you take this, uh, the infinite number of points of the, of the ADS2, and then you put a periodic box around the neck of ADS2. So there is a part of ADS2 which is inside the box, and there's a lot of uh, points that are outside, outside the box. And then, um, if you take uh, the size of the box to be also an integer times the the lattice cutoff, A, another integer N, then all the points essentially which solve the equation now, uh, uh, K square plus L square minus M square equals one, but mod N, okay? Because I have the periodic box. So this is an equation over the ring of integers mod N. So this is the arithmetic geometry I'm talking about. Now, if you see how many points now there are inside the box, there are a finite number of points. They are not only the finite no number of points which lie exactly the hyperboloid inside the box, but there are a lot of uh, other points which uh, the residue modulo n uh, lie inside. So there are many points outside the hyperboloid. Okay. So now you have to. Uh, to work with this space. Now this, this uh, question I told you before, k square plus l square minus m square equals one mod n, gives you the arithmetic geometry. And in the past uh, uh, few years, we have developed the uh, classical and discrete quantum mechanics on this set of points. Now the problem with, uh, so we wanted to have a finite dimensional Hilbert space because of the because of the entropy of the black hole, et cetera, is finite. So you wait to have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, but also to have random properties near the, the, the horizon, okay? So uh, the, now the, the dynamics we use uh, is the, um, in, in this past work, uh, was the, we take uh, the maps which uh, you take a point of the, So you take a point here on the, on the hyperboloid and you act on the left and the right with an element of SL2Z or an element of SL2ZN. So if you take, now you need random, random dynamics as, as much as possible <coughs> because of the scrambling and fast scrambling, scrambling conjecture and you see if wave packets uh, scramble very fast or how fast, etc. Okay, so you choose the appropriate mapping from SL to ZN, and this mapping we choose is the Arnold cut map, which is one, 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 two. Okay, now this has a well-known, um, uh, this is a typical, uh, this is a typical uh, uh, chaotic map, which is used by semi-classical, but quantum people who are doing quantum chaos and classical chaos, etc. But also, um, there is something very interesting happening that uh, uh, when the dimensionality, when the dimensionality of the space time essentially is the number of points in the spatial direction, because this is the support of the wave function of a particle. Okay. Now, if it is uh, number, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, n, okay, then uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space is n. Um, 
And then the, if n uh, is a Fibonacci integer, which is the sequence of points, which is, uh, you know, every integer is the sum of the previous two ones, then this, uh, this map is maximally, the quantum mechanical map is maximally scrambling. And indeed we, we find that the, the, the scrambling times is logarithm of n. This is the previous rule in the previous works. That's why we decided to take seriously the problem of looking at the continuum limit of this, because so scrambled all the geometry of this, it is, to, is it possible to go back. And after two years of efforts, we succeeded to answer in the positive. And the way to do it is the following. Uh, so, uh, if you have M uh, uh, is the radius uh, of the ABS2 in units of the lattice spacing, then you have to solve the equation K square plus L square minus M square equals M square mod N. Okay? Now, if you take M square equals 1 mod N, then you use, you, you, you can't find sequences of M and N going to infinity, so that this equation goes to the continuum equation for ADS2. Are there such, a, such, are there such uh, any such uh, sequences of M and N? Now M, because it's, uh, uh, the radius must be smaller than N, and uh, uh, M square uh, must be equals to one, mod N, and then we have to find sequences m, m say with index n small and n with small. So when both go to infinity, uh, their ratio is constant and it is related to the radius, to the physical radius of the black hole, but also satisfy this equation. Indeed, we found several such sequences. For example, the, uh, uh, again, the Fibonacci sequence is such one. That is, if you take uh, the radius to be fn and the and the uh, box infrared box to be fn plus one, which goes exponentially bigger than the previous one. Okay, so in this case, uh, you find that uh, the limit exists, and because it is the ratio of fn over fn plus one, which is the golden ratio, so we find that for infrared cutoff, which is the golden ratio of the radius of the black hole we find sequences in the continuum limit. But then we are stuck with certain discrete values of the, uh, of the, of the size of the box. We solved also this problem because there are other sequences which are called uh, K Fibonacci. And K Fibonacci are the sequences which every term is K times the previous one plus the uh, previous of the previous one. Okay? So if K equals one, then this is the Fibonacci. If k equals two, three, etc., these are the they are uh, they lead to silver ratios. What is the ratio of n, uh, f n over f n plus one going for n to infinity? This uh, you see that it is this one, which is k plus square root of k square plus one over two. So the radius uh, uh, now uh, the size of the box is this number. Now, if you take k to infinity, you can remove also the infrared cutoff. And uh, you, are go you are going back to the full complete uh, ADS2 surface. If you don't take, if you don't remove the infrared cutoff, the box, you go into the continuum limit inside the box, but the surface you get is all the copies of the infinite hyperboloid modulo the size of the box inside. So we have leaves and leaves and leaves inside the box. So the box is filled up. Uh, okay, so the, now there are many more sequences uh, that uh, we, we had a correspondence with some mathematicians, particularly some Dutch mathematicians which is well known in uh, numerical analysis and computer science, Lenstra, Professor Lenstra, who told us that there is a whole, what we are doing in the language of mathematicians uh, is called profinite groups and uh, profinite integers. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> study a bit this, uh, this theory, but essentially it's a very rich theory, which uh, uh, is, an infinite is an infinite number.
with a, a short interruption for sound reasons. Okay, I think we can. So okay, now I finished uh, just the conclusions, just one page. Yes. Okay, anyway, in this work, we did a lot of uh, study of the number of points, how it goes with n, how it goes with, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, arithmetic questions, because we wanted really to classify uh, what are the jumps of the of the number of points as you increase in this uh, uh, bo box geometry. And uh, we discovered that this is also a, known, a very well-known uh, problem in mathematics, which the, the mathematicians know only the asymptotic form. They don't know uh, uh, the explicit for number of points because it's uh, <coughs> essentially we have to solve uh, very difficult Diophantine uh, equations. So, uh, uh, now ABS2 in a box which is uh, 200 units of the lattice spacing looks like that. Okay, you see the light cones which are evolving around this. Now this we try to see. Also you see certain circles which is the neck, certain cer uh, circles uh, higher, higher, higher. So the the points are organized uh, in uh, in a structure which is reminiscent of the continuum because you keep so much. Uh, now, this is the end of my talk. Now, the, I want to explain the title arithmetic. This is um, uh, arithmetic geometry, or algebraic geometry, more generally. is the study of uh, equation of geometry uh, using equations in which you do not describe if this equation refer to real numbers, complex numbers, addicts, uh, rings of integers, or, okay. So all the properties of the, of the surfaces are studied through only their equations in a certain uh, field, uh, in a certain, certain set of numbers. Now, this kind of studies has led to a very rich uh, theory, um, which is uh, also goes to group theory. You have groups over, uh, for example, you take all the matrices uh, uh, SUN with integers, uh, complex integers, okay, Gaussian integers, and uh, now these symmetries, um, are these groups are finite, but they have not been used in physics yet. Very few of these groups have been uh, used in, uh, in the fractional quantum hole effect. Some people who study this uh, uh, arithmetic properties of the quantum hole effect. Okay, so thank you. This was the... Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions here in Kofu? Yes, one in a minute. I mean, only maybe you said this, but I missed it in the talk. Are there mathematical theorems about the convergence of these sequences? Yes, yes. You can uh, check that they converge because essentially the their ratio that is, you take m square equals one mod n, and m must be smaller than n. Then you must find all possible sequences which satisfy this. Okay. Now these sequences go to infinity. Okay. They don't converge to a point. They, all, all of them they go to infinity, but the ratio should be constant and gives you the ratio of the uh, cutoff of the infra, of the size of the box to the radius of ABS. This is the ratio of the two integers, okay? So um, in the limit, you find real numbers. So uh, real number, that is the ratio may be square, I mean, the box may be squared three times the size, the, the radius of ABS, okay? But um, we could not find, uh, for if you ask the inverse question, if I give you a ratio between L, the size of the box and the radius. What is the sequence of integers which has this limit? This I, I could not, uh, we could not uh, answer. But we found, we tried to find as many as possible 
to enrich the spectrum of the ratios. Okay? This is it. The important thing is the ratios, not the value, because you expect it will go to infinity. When this goes to infinity, <coughs> what you do essentially, you keep the, the size of the of the ADS2 fixed, does not grow, okay, because you keep R fixed and L fixed. So the number of points inside increases and increases and increases, and you go to the, in this sense, you go to the continuum limit. Because the, one of the referees we had, unfortunately, four mathematics, we published this in a journal, Sigma, I don't know if you know it, in a, which is phys, geometry and physics, uh, uh, together, and we had one physicist referee and three mathematicians. So they asked many uh, very interesting details about such questions. That the, the, according to which norm there is a convergence and there is a continuum, etc. And the answer is the induced metric from the from the bed in space time. Okay? So you use this. Okay, although we don't know what are these points, they are numbers. But if you put the lattice sizing, the lattice size, you know where they are in this space, in the embedding space. And then you take the distance of these points in this space, and this is the distance. So you must have the background space. I mean, you cannot from inside say what is the... And all these uh, finite uh, number fields, they don't have norm. They don't have, uh, you know, convergence properties, etc. They are more topological than metric. But according if you want now to take various limits, the one possible limit is also, the, which is an interesting question, you can go also to paddocks. Because if instead of taking the distance of these points according to the uh, usual distance, Euclidean distance, or Minkowski distance, say, okay, uh, there is um, also the, the paddock distance, as you know. So if you take according to the paddock distance, the convergence, then you go to the paddock ADS2. So you reconstruct in this way also the paddock ADS2 because we start we start from finite number of points increase 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 and then where it goes it goes to a set of points which they, they have a continuum uh, limit and this continuum limit is what is the real numbers or it is the this depends crucially on which norm in the bedding time the space time you use okay. Okay, any other questions here? Maybe I, I wanted to make a very short comment. Uh, it reminded me a little bit, uh, if you consider the fuzzy torus, the finite fuzzy torus, mm -hmm. then there is also, for example, the, the modular group can, is actually replaced by SL2Z and then such, such things. Exactly. So they also occur. Yeah, yeah. It is the same thing. Yeah. And also, you, but, but this is flat. Yeah. This, yeah. Uh, this is the pro, So it is a somehow. Uh, in the torus, you have only uh, is a rectangular. The lattice is rectangular sure. because it's this curve here. The number of points is randomly distributed. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, are there any questions online? I don't see any questions. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. I said I don't. Uh, so we have lunch break and we resume again at 4 p.m.